All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is May 29th, 2024, and we are going to keep digging. I said in the last video that we would get into Zephaniah. I caught something. A brother had shared something. Uh, our brother um, uh, 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 Jake had shared something with me, and I hadn't seen it before. And so I looked through Zephaniah with a bit of a of a different lens. I mentioned in the last video how it's how it it's a type of pre mid and post, but not at the beginning of the pre, if you will. It's not about the the pre trib group being taken. It's not about the mid trib group being taken. It's not about well. At the end, it is about the coming of the Lord. But it, what you're going to see it was is that it's all related to Judah in a pre, mid, and post context. So that's what we're going to get into tonight. And before we get in there, we're going to spend a little time in something, um, a, a, a number, a number of years count that our brother um, down in Florida, uh, Dennis, had sent me uh, a Oh, two, three, four days ago, something like that. And I thought it was really cool. Talk about a connection to years and what they mean in their numbers biblically. So we're going to, once we get going, that's where we're going to start. So we're going to have a lot of fun digging into this. And the next one is going to be pretty wild. It's going to be a little bit intense in the in what we're going to be watching. I'm going to share a video. Uh, we're going to watch the whole thing. I'll probably stop along the way and discuss it. And then we're going to show the reality of this season and time that we're in. And I believe it is so telling what they have coming and what is already happening in the world and what is about to take place in the midst of taking place and how it's going to progress. And the time frame that they have for it is astronomical. And when you see the things that are coming, if you've been following world events and and, and the things that AI can do and how quickly it's multiple times faster learning than anything ever before in history. And so when you see the shift and the things that are going to come and some things that seem like, nah, that's just too far fetched. They're they're way thinking too far in advance. No, when you understand and study it, I study these things as well. And when you when you follow it and you understand and you see the speed of these things. And, and track these, these the way things move and have moved all throughout history, it just sends like a chill. You're like, oh my goodness. When you see it and what their, what their hoped for goal is at the end is this utopia by the time it reaches this certain point, you think, oh my goodness. This is, this is the enemy trying to supersede God's plan and we know the enemy isn't going to make it this beautiful utopia for the whole world. But that's what we hear them talking about. And so in the next one, we're going to go through that and then we're going to lay out what this does to help solidify this season and time we're in. Because if they're right, well, then they're the ones bringing about everything. They're the ones that will bring about this utopia and, and everybody just money coming in because machines will run everything. It's coming. But will it fully happen? No. Not if the Lord's plan comes first and the Lord's peace on earth is established. I, act, I absolutely believe it gives even more uh, um, power, more understanding to this year we are in right now. Because even though that already started, that only really started about a year ago. When, when the, um, uh, um, what is it, that uh, AI chat GPT-4 was made available to the world because then it was open to the internet and everything and now the learning speed that everything's coming in at and on the cars on everything including robots is astronomical and so we'll get into that in the next video and then we'll we'll also settle everybody's hearts after watching the video it seems intense and for people that like tech they were like man this that would be pretty wild but not as awesome as it would be being with the Lord, of course. All right? So everybody's hearts will be settled in, in the latter part of that video when we then go to break down where we are and, and how much that gives us more confidence in where we are right now in what's about to start. So if you're new to the ministry, like I always start, come to this playlist right here. 
if you're just coming across ministry revealed you're going to hear some things like 14 years of tribulation and a period of time called above that above is 50 days you're going to think that we're nuts you're going to hear things like who the gospels are speaking to and then see them being revealed in different ways throughout videos and you're going to think these guys are absolutely nuts i promise you with all of my heart if you go to ministryrevealed.com right here and go to the page called intro and we'll start by studying and watching the first four videos or you can come to the playlist right here and watch this one the revealed end time study note series and just watch the first four videos the first video is a 22 minute intro video as you see here to the next three videos that will follow it'll give you a little bit of groundwork so you're, you you can start watching with an understanding a little bit of understanding of what's coming the second video is simply a 30 minute we've got three hour videos on these things but it's a 30 minute intro bible study of the differences within the synoptic gospels interesting that there's three synoptic gospels right and then yet john stands on his own i never invented that i don't even know why it was set up that way i don't know who called it like that but we've been able to reveal through scripture <coughs> excuse me how john literally stands on his own in what he prophetically reveals within the words of things that already took place we also then go into the gospels and within uh, the synoptic gospels and in the synoptic gospels of matthew mark luke you've read in scripture the last will be first the first will be last that's because matthew mark luke in the end of days goes luke mark and matthew and one very simple one i like to share to give people an understanding is if you go look at what jesus was wearing or arrayed in going to the cross or just before going to the cross in luke he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe which means white radiant beautiful right it, it means a gorgeous white robe if you go to mark he was arrayed in purple if you go to matthew he was arrayed in scarlet and i always like to say these guys were they colorblind in their recollection no it's prophecy all of these differences within the synoptic gospels are all prophetic they are the mysteries hidden within the scriptures that are revealing prophecy just like the white gorgeous robe is like a bride the white gorgeous robe isn't in tribulation what about purple and scarlet that's right purple and scarlet the woman riding the beast is wearing purple and scarlet so these are the types of things so what does that mean well that means there's something to a connection in luke about a bride Whereas Mark has a group relating to purple that are in tribulation and Matthew has a group relating to scarlet that's in tribulation. And when you start to understand this, as it starts to reveal itself to you, you're going to understand that these mysteries, these differences within the Gospels, there are dozens of them and we have revealed dozens of them. They all tell the same story. Pre, mid and post. There are three groups. A Gentile uh, bride washed who is clean, who is in Christ, spirit-filled, going pre-trip. They're going to the third heaven. And you end up seeing this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is giving us not only what he did in those days, but it is a prophetic, deeper understanding within it where Paul sees the first group that is in Christ, spirit-filled. They're the ones that go pre-trib like a rapture to the third heaven. The second group is him saying, I knew a person kind of like the first one, which means not in Christ like the first one, but, you know, believers, they go to the rapture, it says. There was caught up. It's the Greek word harpazo, which is the English word rapture that we use. And they go to paradise. And then he goes down further and he says, this is the third time I'm coming. Uh, this is the third time, but I'm coming to you. So the first one was a taking. The second one was a taking. And the third one is him coming to them. And people say, no, that's not what it is. I promise you, it is absolutely what it is prophetically weaved in to what Paul was saying. And do you know how he starts it? I knew a man in Christ above 14 years. Above. That's the above portion I mentioned earlier, 50 days that starts everything. And it starts with the, the pre-trib, that group, pre-trib, white gorgeous robe going to the third heaven. That's what's happening. Then, 
you have what we see in um, within the gospel. So now you're hearing this 14 years. And you're like, 14 years? When you get to the third video, it's the intro, another 30-minute intro. We've got hours of study on these things, proving it out all throughout Scripture. But the third one is a 30-minute intro of the revelation of the 14 years of the end of days. It is seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. Not one seal per year, that does, not one trumpet per year, but that they play out over seven years and seven years. And what you realize is seals is to Mark's group. Mark's group is the world of church. It's those not in Christ. They're not spirit-filled. They're, they're still living in the world. They don't desire Christ above all things. That's the world of church. And not everybody is ready in Christ spirit-filled. That's the big difference. But here's the thing. They're not left. They're, they're not just cast aside and never to be saved. Theirs is the seven years of seals. And the great multitude rapture of Revelation chapter 7 that happens be after the sixth seal and before the seventh seal is in the seventh year of seals at the great multitude rapture. We've been able to show it. We can prove it out. And you will come to understand these things even as you understand them within the Gospels. You understand the above and then the 14 years. You will then understand how the Gospels play out in relation to the discourses. And you will see the end of times revealed. You will then see why there are differences in the discourses themselves in how they're spoken of and how they're revealed. The differences in words. The length of the discourse and the things said with them being different, each one from the other. And Matthew, of course, being the seven years of trumpets, is Matthew's gospel. And theirs when, is going to be when the Lord then returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Pre, mid, and post are all true. And these are the types of things that you're going to understand. And you will realize why everybody's been arguing about pre, mid, and post, and can explain it within different places of Scripture, even myself back years ago. I used to bounce between pre-trib and mid-trib because I could see Scriptures for both. And people will stand on those Scriptures, no matter what anybody tries to say. No, 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 it's this, this is mid. And somebody will show, well, no, look at this, this is pre. And somebody else will say, look, obviously it's post. The answer is, they're all true. And to understand the timing of their truth, you must understand the differences of who the Gospels are speaking to, that it plays out over 14 years in a period called above. And finally, when you get to the fourth video, it's the answer. It's a big video. It's about two hours and 45 minutes, and it's about how this all got missed. And the video is called, It's All Because of Matthew. Everybody for hundreds of years has been taught from the foundation of Matthew from pastors and seminaries all over the place, their foundation of the Synoptic Gospels is always found in Matthew. You rarely hear studies and in church from Mark and even less from Luke. They only go to it to maybe try to fill in blanks of things that happened. And their focus within the Gospels is always Matthew. And that's because they never understood, it was never yet made known, the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. So because all of their understanding comes from Matthew, all of their foundation comes from Matthew. So whenever they see something, they're trying to correlate it to what they've understood in the Gospel of Matthew, especially in relation to, to prophecy. They'll always go to Matthew 24 like a broken record and try to show pre-trib when clearly Jesus is coming is immediately after the tribulation of those days. It's when he's returning feet down as lightning from one end to the other. So when you see these things, as they begin to open unto you, I promise you, you will see Scripture in a light that you have never understood before, and questions that you've had and concerns that you've had that you've just accepted that you didn't know, which is what we had to do, will now start to reveal themselves to you. It is powerful. It is exciting. And like so many others here in this ministry, it gets you deeper and deeper seeking the Lord. That's what it does. You know, as much as we're looking for the time of when it's going to happen, and we have an expected time frame that we've been watching here for a year, we know the season and time. When now we're just praying that we've understood the year. So even though that's part of the deal, that's really just the cherry on the top. The greatest part of this 
happening in the ministry here is the revelation itself because the revelation is the spirit of prophecy this is the spirit of christ this is the spirit that's led us in all of this if it wasn't the case we would have known it decades centuries ago it was a mystery held till the end to be revealed in the final generation and once it was revealed once whatever the time frame of the lord was then the end would begin and guess what that seven years is coming up this year this year is seven years this year is seven years for the revelation 12 sign and this year is the end of a true count for 70 years so let's get into it let me show you what our brother dennis shared with me it'll tie right into this man you guys know i like my coffee i got some really good coffee up here and it's it's awesome that one was just a real good one so i had to mention it <laughs> sorry <laughs> it was a really good sip all right so we all know that this period of time that we've been talking about here for at least a year is related to the eighth of av we have videos i'm not going to go into it all here why the eighth of av is truly the seventh sabbath of the feast of weeks and it's all about the understanding of the wheat harvests there are two this is all about the older called winter wheat that goes first then the above that i mentioned begins on the ninth of av now the question has been is it really going to be this year okay we absolutely i believe we've proven it we'll, we'll show it in in the next video as well we'll really get into it after i go through that video and and strengthen and give us the confidence of it again but i'll break it down in relation to what we'll be sharing in the next video but the ninth of av is the beginning of the above that i mentioned earlier that takes us to the end of 50 days which is the 29th of elul and truly is pentecost it sounds crazy you're gonna say no this guy doesn't know what he's talking about well i promise you as i promised you if you watch those intro videos i'm promising you this is the true 50-day count this is the end of the seven sabbaths of the weed harvest and this is true pentecost what follows the day and hour no one knows begins the 14 years okay so where does the bride go at the end of the seventh sabbath right in here so depending where you are in the world 12th of august is what we've been looking at okay so the ninth of av Look at what happened on the 9th of Av. Both temples were destroyed on the 9th of Av. Okay, when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed King Solomon's, and then the second temple built by Ezra and Nehemiah was destroyed by the Romans on August 7, uh, uh, sorry, on August 2nd, 70 CE, scattering the people of Judah, commencing the Jewish exile from the Holy Land. This is the beginning. And what was it? 70 ce now i've had conversations with people and when you really understand where christ was born it wasn't actually the year 70 ce okay it wasn't 70 a.d but we work and we live on a gregorian calendar okay we're on a gregorian calendar the thing that's great about it and and what i often share i've shared with people in the past is that the, the, the understanding years isn't difficult to count. I used to say this a long time ago. Summer and winter. Summer and winter. Summer and winter. You can't trick me into how many years have gone by. You can't tell me I'm not 51 years old. Okay? A summer and a winter. A summer and a winter. So we're not being fooled by how many years are going by. So when we count, knowing that we're in a Gregorian calendar, when they went back, because you got to remember the Gregorian calendar wasn't until, what, about, uh, give or take, 500-some years ago? Which means 1,500 years before that, they weren't on a Gregorian calendar. So how could it have been 70 AD? Right? Well, it wasn't 70 AD. There was no Gregorian calendar. All right? So when we see this, ah, and you would say, ah, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So if we go to the prophecies of Scripture... And we see, ah, Jerusalem, 70 years and Jerusalem would be destroyed. Well, hold on a second. A lot of people try to account to that for 70 AD. But 
there was no count of 70 AD. The temple had been around for what, two, three hundred some odd years. So it's not like they were in the land only for 70 years, and that fulfills the 70 that people talk about in Scripture. It didn't exist. There was no 70 at that point in that understanding. There was no 70 years that they'd been in the land at that point. But what is important is that the destruction that comes upon them happens at the ninth of Av. And it just so happens the revelation that we'd known for many years was the fasting in the morning of the fifth month to the fasting of the morning of the seventh month. The destruction happened, the following destruction happened on uh, Tishri 1 with the Feast of Trumpets. They observe it over here, but it happened on the Feast of Trumpets. What's in between? You got it. 50 days. And it's that wasn't just something we picked up. That's just, it was revealed from Scripture, and we've done many, many teachings on it. So, knowing this on a Gregorian calendar, okay? So if we take, for example, I have it on the 12th, okay? Uh, the 9th of Av is on the 13th, but you know the Jews, it goes from the 12th to the 13th. So I just have it set on the 12th. If you go August 12th, 70 AD, okay? We're not far. It happened, they would say it was August 2nd on a Gregorian calendar. So August 12th, 70 AD, and you add how many years? 1,954 years gets you to 2024. You think, well, that's no big deal. Why, why 1954? That's, that's not such a big stretch of anything. 1,954 years from 70 AD, the destruction on a Gregorian count. What makes this number so significant? Well, we got a few reasons for it, right? Let me show you one of them. The count of when Israel came into the land, according to Leviticus, whether you go in the land and then count with Jerusalem or just when they came into the land. Because let me show you something. Israel came into the land in 19, whoops, in 1948, okay? So if we go 1948 and we say 75 years, we get to 2023. Well, wait a second, something must be wrong. Well, of course something's wrong. We know that the count didn't begin at the Feast of Trumpets. We're just leaving this date for now, okay? At the Feast of Trumpets. So when we know that the count is Feast of Trumpets, and that they had to come into the land and plant all manner of trees, knowing that they're the house of Judah, we know the count didn't begin until Feast of Trumpets, 1949. Add 75 years. And of course, you get to 2024, August 12th, but for the Feast of Trumpets. Meaning, they're in the 75th year. It's coming to an end. And we know of its importance because of what Leviticus told us in chapter 19 about what they were to do when they come into the land, okay? So now we're back. 1954, the number of years, brings us to 2024. Let's have a look at what our brother went and looked up to find out what the number 1954 equals in Hebrew. You guessed it. Hosea. Hosea, the name of Joshua, Yeshua, the son of Nun, salvation. You guys know why this was important for us, right? When we go to Hosea chapter 1, what do we see? 14 chapters, and it says, The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. Yeshua, Jesus. That's another name for Jesus, the deliverer, salvation. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife. Okay? What does that mean, a wife of whoredom and children of whoredom? That simply means Gentiles. Go get your Gentile bride. For those of you who have been following the channel for a bit, Hosea has 14 chapters, and it's written to the Gentiles. Right? The, the house of Israel, Gentiles grafted in. It's fantastic. And Hosea's name is the Hebrew word 1954. Kind of interesting, right? We even have it in the New Testament where Paul is telling us in Romans 
starting in verse 24, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in Osi, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not my beloved. Hello. For who? Hosea, 1954. Hosea, 1954. And the count begins 1954. The count begins 1954. And from that count, we do 70 years. 2023, 2024, Feast of Trumpets, 70 years is ending. That's awesome. What about in the Greek? In the Greek, the word is used one time, and it's the leftover or remaining. Not as some of you guys who have been following for a bit might think. It doesn't mean the left behind church in this case. <clears throat> Let's go have a look. Just so happens this word is used one time in our beloved first Peter. Right? That's a big deal for us, isn't it? <clears throat> it says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that is suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest. That's kind of weird, right? That he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to do the will of God. The word rest <clears throat> is, in the context, seems to be telling us the, 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 a being left behind. Yet, it's talking about the rest of this person's life. Who is the rest of this person, this, this people's lives? What is the rest of their lives? It's those who are left behind. Now, not just left behind as in those who were uh, um, not accounted worthy to go pre-trib, not the church left behind, but Look at the term, left over. Left over. The remaining leftover time of his life, but also this leftover group that we know are part of the bride. Now, how can I, how can I show that? Because we know who, who First Peter is speaking to. We've taught on it so many times. So let's go to First Peter 1 and find out exactly who they are. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers. Who are the strangers? The remnant workers, right? The Smyrna remnant leftovers, the, the ones who are from the pre-trib bride going that were chosen to remain. To the strangers scattered throughout these places, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, that fades not away, reserved for you in heaven, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. A people from among the Gentiles, the strangers, which means Gentiles, who have an inheritance incorruptible, who are kept by the power of God right now, unto faith, uh, through faith unto salvation, that are ready to be revealed in the last time, which means what? In the end of days. We know who this group is, right? A group being prepared. We see them also. So just as we see this connection to the bride and, and this entire conversation within Romans, we also know that it's directly connected in, in Peter. So we see it connected in First Peter as that remnant group. We see how they're connected to Gentiles and connected to Hosea. We know Christ comes for the pre-trib connected to both, for which there is a portion of them that remain. For which, again, we see them in Romans. And then we see them right here. This is that same group. In Romans 8, starting in verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not, yet re for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. 
the spirit itself bears witness with, with witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Why is that so important? Joint heirs with Christ. I always say how how hard that is to to comprehend because it is. But what is this joint heirs with Christ? Sure, it's connected to everybody pre-trip. But there's a specific conversation here to a group that's chosen to remain. And their joint heirship with them are the ones who will be sitting in his throne with them as he sits in his father with his, in his father's with his. It's those who are the same Smyrna group that are resurrected, having put their necks on the line, that will be resurrected to rule and reign with Christ for the millennium. And who are they? If they suffer with them, that they should be glorified together with them. Connected to who? A leftover from 1 Peter that they should now live the rest of their lives in this service of the Lord. This group being, being kept, reserved until the time of the end, to be revealed at the time of the end. When the Lord comes and he's, he's with them and they're with them for 40 days, they will now live the rest of their lives as the remaining leftovers no longer in the lusts and in the sins that they were before caught up in. Remember, they're the stones. They're the little lambs, right? So awesome. So all that from our brother digging in and doing a count that gave him the number 1,954, only to find out we have that exact number of 1,954 that began the 70-year count, which historically was a 70 years in a Gregorian calendar that when the 70 years were over, destruction upon Jerusalem. Funny how that happens, right? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Just another, just another little tidbit, another little glimpse that's pointing to this year the 1954th year in a 1954 year count from 70. 70 years, 1954, 2024. 1954 years, 70 years, and 2024. Come on. How often does it have to keep pointing to this year, right? It's exciting. Okay. Now, let's get into... Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter one. And let me go into Zephaniah here. This program that I use for anybody that's new and is interested is uh, a program called eSword. Uh, it used to be free. It might still be free for PC. I don't know. I only have it on my PC. I have something else on my phone. And other than that, I think it's only $5 or $9 a year or something like that. This program is awesome. You can download all sorts of Bible translations. I only use KJV+. Plus. I have KJV and another one here, but I, I only use KJV+, Plus on it. And why the plus? For this right here. See these word definitions that show up? This is the difference right here. You want to understand Scripture as you never have before? Having a program like this and reading through the Scriptures and seeing a word that's maybe caught your attention and you want to go see what the definition is, you can go see the deeper detail. You can go in deeper and further to see what the root word is. And you will come to understand that not every word means the same word. You're going to see a little bit about that tonight when we get to the point in relation to um, Babylon and fornication. There's more than one terminology being used for the word fornication and how it's used and when and where is very important i'm starting to find out in relation to mystery babylon so we're gonna it's going to lead us into that that'll kind of be the the midway point through zephaniah but we're not going to go extremely down that end in relation to mystery babylon the the woman right the the, the whore of Babylon and all that. But 
we are definitely going to touch on it because as I went through this, understanding what Zephaniah was revealing and the timing of it, I couldn't help but see what we see and, and these connections as we go into the book of Revelation when we get to there about what she is and, and what prophetically connects her from the past in the Old Testament to the future is to come. So we'll get into that. So what ended up, as, as I said earlier, our brother Jake had sent me something that he was kind of seeing a pre-mid post in it. I had said I'd gone into it before, and it just it, it really just didn't fit a pre, like a pre-group being taken, and then a mid-trib rapture group being taken, and then the Lord's return feet down. And that's because I was looking at it through the wrong lens. It actually tells you the lens. It shows you the lens. Now, here's the thing. In, your, in our Bibles, it's not there, right? Or, or sorry, in certain programs, it's not there. But in our Bibles, they give us headings sometimes, right? Like this one. And it starts with the coming judgment on Judah, right? So the coming judgment on Jerusalem and Judah. Well, that's the beginning of the end of days, the beginning time of the 14 years. Look what happens in chapter 2. Judgment on Judah's enemies. Huh. It dawned on me, and I said, wait a second. Judgment on Judah, then judgment on, on Judah's enemies. So what we should be able to find is something about judgment starting in chapter 1 coming against Judah. That will scatter them, which is precisely what we talk about and what I was mentioning earlier is coming first. Then when the Jews recognize when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth seal, what does he do? He destroys his Judah's enemies that scattered them. Huh. And then I went to chapter 3, and I saw the heading, Judgment on Jerusalem and the Nations. And I thought, just that title alone, I know exactly where we read Judgment on Jerusalem and the Nations. You guys will see when we get there. This is all a pre, mid, and post, but not in people group being people groups being taken, pre, mid, and post. It's all about what's coming against Jerusalem. So let's get into it. We see right here in Zephaniah chapter one verse two. <laughs> it's pretty clear right off the bat. I will utterly consume all things off the land. So hit the Lord. Um, that's exactly what happens, right? If we go into Zechariah, so Zephaniah, where are you? We go into Zechariah chapter 1. We know that this begins when he's telling them in chapter 12, and it says, sorry, in chapter 1, verse 12, then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah? against which thou hast had indignation these, there it is, 70 years. Indignation against Jerusalem and Judah on, on the land. These 70 years. Interesting how that works, right? So we now know they're about to be scattered. It says, I will consume man and beast and I will consume... Uh, the fowls of the heaven, the fishes of the sea, and the stumbling blocks with the wicked, and I will cut off man from off the land. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from his place, from this place, and the name of the cherubim with the priests. Verse 6. And them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired of him. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests. <clears throat> clean, right? To be clean. This isn't the group that had to be cleaned. This is a group that is clean. To be clean. They are clean. What does it say? He hath. Past tense. 
he has bid his guests. So a group that were clean, that have been called out, have already happened. You see how it's not connected to pre? These are the things that follow in the pre at the end, like within those 50 days, like to the end of those 50 days, when then Jerusalem will be destroyed. This reminded me, as I was going through it, it reminded me of Luke chapter 14. We've shared on this. We've got uh, some videos that talk about it. We know how there are two weddings. There are two end-of-days weddings. This is the pre-trib Gentile bride wedding in Luke. There is no wedding in Mark. And then, of course, there's a wedding at the end of tribulation that relates to Matthew's group for Judah. And listen to what it says. Starting in verse 7. And he put forth a parable for those which were bidden. Hmm. For those which were bidden to call. When he marked how they chose out the chief room, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. So this is something we've shared on many times, right? When, when and whoever hears this is found accounted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man, that is being taken, they're gone to the third wedding, I mean the third heaven, pre-trib, never having tasted of death, and you get to the wedding, don't go sit down in the highest room there in heaven. Sit down in the lowest room, as the scripture tells us. And if you're somebody to be honored as a guest, they will come and get you and bring you up into the higher room. Pretty wild, right? This is prophetic insight. This is a prophetic parable for the pre-trib at the end of days. Nobody in this ministry, as I've said in the past, nobody in this ministry should be caught sitting in the highest room. We should all be sitting in the lowest room, having understood these things before. But what, what's my point in it and sharing it for this? When you're called, right? When you're called of any man to a wedding, well, if you're called to go to a wedding, are you the bride? Or are you the guest? The bride's not called to a wedding. <laughs> you see, it's her wedding. So I, I, I don't want to put, and, and I don't want to go down this trail right now. It's something I've talked privately with a few people because, you know, in this pre-trib wedding that takes place, is it that we're all actually the bride? Is everybody that goes pre-trib the bride of Christ? Or is there a bride within the wedding and everybody or, or the majority going pre-trib are the guests who have been called to go to be part of that family of that wedding? You see? Now, I don't really go into it and I haven't studied into it too much, although I've seen it in different places. But... The, the point is, is it doesn't really matter. It's still about going pre-trib, okay? It's still about going pre-trib. And it might very well be that everybody being called to go to the wedding is a part of the bride. You know, you may have seen pictures um, when people sh have pictures of the pre-trib and, and the Gentile bride going. They, they show like the back of a woman in a long white dress and they have all of these faces of people in the gown. That might be the call that are part of the wedding, you see? So whether their guests are actually part of the bride, if you will, it's the, the, the point is it equals the same thing. But in this, you have what I'm trying to point to here is this called out group, this group that was bidden, right? This group that was bidden called his guests that he has already called out before he brings this destruction on Jerusalem and Judah. Pretty great connection too. So, uh, let's see what else. Verse 10. So back in Zephaniah 1 verse 10. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord, uh, saith the Lord, that there shall be a noise of a cry from the fish gate and a howling from the second and a great crashing on the hills. Uh, verse 12. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles. 
that I will search Jerusalem with candles. You see, remember this ca these candles, this glistening, this burning light? Where else do we see this connection? Uh, where was it? Da -da -da -da. Isaiah, our famous chapter, Isaiah chapter 9. We see it with, with the darkness, right? So this is the first attack that's coming on the 9th of Av. It's coming on Neph uh, Nephtali and Zebulun in the northern part of Israel, which I believe will be Haifa and Tel Aviv. And when he comes to them, he's coming to them first how? Well, it'll be darkness and they will see a great light. So he's coming what? As a candle, as a lamp burning as light. And they're going to see him coming in the darkness. This is when the Son of Man, as we know, has been is coming to begin his 40 days. Let's keep going. Uh, verse 13. Therefore, their goods shall become a booty, and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, and they shall not drink the wine thereof. You see, everything becomes a booty. Everything is going to start to get taken from them. Remember that in 2 Chronicles? In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, we see this exact same thing. We talked about it even in the last video in relation to Nebuchadnezzar. This first attack that's coming by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and what does he do? He's going to carry away the vessels. He's going to carry away their riches and their things. You see, Babylon with goodly vessels from the house of the Lord. This is that end of 70. This is why I was showing you. Not only was it after 70 years here, but this was also a 70 years. when. But it was on the 70 on the opposite end, right? He destroyed them. They were 70 years in captivity. The typology is both the beginning of uh, uh, the end of 70 and then another one being end of 70. And that's something we shared and touched on in the last video. This is a count from when they come into the land and counting it as Leviticus told us. This one is the end of 70 from when they got the rest, they captured the rest of Jerusalem. And scripture gives us a picture of two 70s, one that begins it and one that once it's over, it's destruction upon all the nations that were with the beast and everything else. Again, something we're going to be able to show in Scripture. So we see it here also in 2 Chronicles 36. And, of course, wouldn't you know it, look at what we find here as well. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had kept her Sabbaths, for as long as she lay desolate, uh, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Seventy years. Funny how that happens, right? Seventy years, seventy years, and seventy years. Now we can see the booty, the things that they took after they bring about this destruction. Uh, what else? Verse 15. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 15. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Well, we see those things in many places, don't we? One of the places we've shared on many times oh, in the past is Psalms 18. Psalms 18, for those that have been around for a little while, you'll know our chapters to years. Psalms 18 is in that 50-day period of time, okay, in the above. And what do we see happen? We see the Lord, the nostrils, uh, coals were kindled by it. He, he, bow, he bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub, yea, he did fly. He did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion round about him, dark waters, thick clouds of the skies. Okay? At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones, coals of fire. This is, these are events that are coming. 
right after the pre-trip and quite possibly within that first seven days that has him then coming in those thick clouds, the destruction upon them and so forth. Where's another place? Here's another one. Um, again, something we taught on many times in the past. In Jeremiah chapter 4, we see in Jeremiah chapter 4, this destruction that comes from the north first, which is Syria, which is the lion coming up from his thicket. And what do we see? All of this stuff declaring from the nations, desolation is coming. We see sound the trumpet of the alarm. What is this trumpet of the alarm? It's the trumpet of the alarm that will take place at the Feast of Trumpets. And what do we see? Destruction upon destruction. For the whole of the land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. They become covered in darkness, right? The whole land shall be desolate. Yet I won't make a full end, right? Because he's going to bring Jerusalem back after. For this shall the earth mourn and the heavens above shall be black. Blackness. Mount, uh, uh, um, clouds covering. A light needing to shine in it. All of this connecting to the destruction of Jerusalem. It's coming upon Judah, and Judah is in all the land. It begins with an attack in the north, and at the sound of the trumpet, what do we see? Oh, at the sound, at the day of the trumpet and alarm. Do you think I was setting you up there? <laughs> of course I was. Of course I was. That's why Jeremiah was telling us the exact same thing in the exact same place of Scripture that we've been teaching about it. Uh, verse 17, Zephaniah 1. And I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men. Why would they walk like blind men? Because they're going to be in darkness. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. For his jealousy. Oh, wait a second. That should be something else we know too, right? What if we go back to Zechariah chapter 1? And in Zechariah chapter 1, what did it say? What did the Lord say about this? Uh, where is it? 14. 15, 14. So here where we see this judgment coming upon them these 70 years. Verse 14, so the angel that communed with me said unto me, cry thou, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous. I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was a little displeased and they helped forward the affliction. You know, when you get to chapter <clears throat> 8, which is the first year equivalent, the first year of trumpets in relation to the chapters to years. Seals is now over, and the seven years of trumpets are beginning. The Lord, as we know and have shown, is on Mount Zion, that he came down with paradise, and it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I was jealous for her with a great fury. You see, how does he start it off? He's jealous for it. He's jealous. These 70 years, meaning the 70th year, he is bringing this destruction upon Judah. He's going to rid the land and only a remnant will be brought back to be able to build what people will think will be the rebuilding of the temple. But the only thing, as we've taught many times, that will get rebuilt is the foundation. That is all that will get rebuilt because then more chaos will come and everything will stop. Why is the Lord doing this? For one, we know he's doing it because of, of their disobedience, right? Their stiff-neckedness. So, I mean, all we got to do is go back to the last video or go back even into Second Chronicles 36 
And we see in 2 Chronicles 36 that it was for the, the stubbornness, the stiff-neckedness, this, this refusal to be obedient and to repent and turn to the Lord by Judah. Specifically in 36, in 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Chronicles 36, it's talking about Zephaniah, whose name, like Netanyahu, Netanyahu had been changed, right? So what do we see? This punishment for disobedience in Leviticus 26. He's going to point terror over them. There's a great destruction coming over them. I will punish you seven times for your sins. That's seven years. They must be removed from the land for seven years so that it can rest, but it's also their punishment for their sin. Uh, verse Leviticus 26, 21. And if ye walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. See, they're going to be destroyed by the sword. They're going to be destroyed by the sword, by pestilence, by famine. And they're going to be delivered into their enemies' hands. Crazy, crazy stuff. When you read in Leviticus 26, we haven't gone there in a long time, but you read what's coming, this punishment for their disobedience, <coughs> it's, it, it's heart-wrenching. Because when you understand what people can do to each other, when certain things occur, man. So you see, this is what we're seeing here in Zephaniah chapter 1. This, this jealousy of the Lord, this bringing destruction upon the land, being this time of gloominess and thick darkness of clouds, this, this sounding of the trumpet of alarm, this taking of their, of their possessions, of these things of value, the Lord being this candle having to search for them being the light it's all connected to the events coming upon israel or uh, coming upon the land of the jews right in judah and jerusalem this is how the tribulation begins after the pre-trib is taken and he just so happens to have told us that he had already bid his guests i thought that was awesome as well so now we'll go into Zephaniah chapter 2 and as we go here into Zephaniah chapter 2 this is where we're going to go down some uh, so a, a deep rabbit trail and find these connections that we're going to touch on some of them like we're going to go pretty heavy into some <coughs> excuse me in relation to the woman but it, it's not the end of the story but this is something I know myself and a few others. I know um, Jake as well. It's something he's been emailing back and forth on in relation to trying to understand, uh, even our brother Ivan, uh, in relation to trying to understand when this destruction of Babylon is coming. And is it possible, is it possible that there's more than one Babylon? I, I don't believe there's more than one Babylon. But I believe there's more than one destruction coming on Babylon. And I believe you'll see that. And, and what I mean by that is I think you're about to see the destruction of Babylon, this judgment coming on her. I would say judgment coming first before an absolute destruction of Babylon later. You'll see what I mean as I go through. So Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired. So now all of a sudden, <clears throat> it goes from their devastation, being destroyed, being scattered, nobody allowed to stay. And now, gather yourselves together, O nation not desired. We know that, when does, when does Judah get to be gathered back? Judah gets gathered back after the great multitude rapture. You see, this is what I was talking about at the beginning, uh, earlier in it, is that, we know for the Jews that they've been blinded for our sakes so that we can come in. But once the church, once the world, the, the Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel come in, then the blinders come off the Jews. You see, they've been blinded for our sakes, made enemies for our sakes until the fullness of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles happens in the seventh year of seals. 
once they've come in, then the Jews come in. You see, we've seen it. We've been able to show it in many places. <clears throat> but let me show you again. We see now in Zechariah chapter 8, right? We, we just covered a little bit. The Lord is no longer jealous. He's there on Mount Zion. They're going to start rebuilding the temple now in the first half of trumpets. He explains why you couldn't before because the affliction. I said everybody against their neighbor. And then in verse 13, he now says, And it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. They're there. Why are the Jews suddenly there? Because, as we've explained in the past, the Jews have one of the, the reasons they've been blinded. Now, of course, it was the Lord's will so that the Gentiles can be grafted in and, and all that be taken care of. But one of the big pieces of this is the fact that their prophecies haven't yet been fulfilled. You see, when the Lord came the first time, as we were showing, the temple was already standing. They're looking for a Messiah who is going to defeat their enemies who scattered them and killed them and rebuild the temple. So when Messiah came the first time, that was impossible. The temple had been standing for 300 or so years. You see, they hadn't been scattered. They were living in the land. So not only were they blinded by the Lord, but the things that they understood prophetically that still needed to happen hadn't yet happened. So they were blinded from understanding certain things that are in their prophecies about Christ that he did fulfill. And in this blinding, they focused on the things that hadn't yet been fulfilled. That was the Lord's will. And we could see it. Again, this one's in Isaiah 6. In Isaiah 6, starting in verse 8, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. Right? A typology of Christ. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear you indeed, but understand not. And see you indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy. And shut their eyes, lest they see with their e eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. What? <laughs> it always gets me when I hear this, right? <laughs> you read this and you're like, wait a second. Isn't the whole point of Christ having come to save all of them? Well, it was. But not them yet. Because had they understood, it would have been over, and all the Gentiles that are grafted in with Israel would have been left for hell. We couldn't have converted. It would have been over. You see? But then we find out how long it's going to be. Z uh, Isaiah 6.11. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant. And the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. Sound familiar? And the Lord hath removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Awesome, right? Awesome. He did all of this for all of us. I was talking with our brother, brother uh, Olu earlier today, and... You know, as you as you dig and in, in really comprehend these things, and I know most of the people listening have, oh, they do understand, right? They've been following for a while. But in particular, for those that are new or newer, when you really begin to understand these revelations, see these pe these portions and period of times being spoken to, it it it's incredible how everything opens up. And it's not just that everything opens up and, and you get to understand the mysteries. It's, it's when you realize what it means. When, when you realize that they're mysteries that have been hidden since the foundation of the earth. When, when you realize the, the, the purpose that God did so many of these things. We don't understand everything, of course. But more than has ever been revealed before. 
we get the insight into God's purpose of why he did certain things with certain groups at certain times and, and the purpose and plan of how it plays out in the years to come. You couldn't have changed the fact that 90% of the, of the claiming church is going to be left behind during seals. You, you can't change that. It was purpose since before creation. Now, here's the thing. When I say purposed, I mean it's not that God wanted it. It's not that it was meant to. It's that because God foreknows everything. Not that that's what he wanted. He wanted all to be saved. But he knows not all will be saved because he knows the beginning from the end. You see? So it, it's not purposed, but it was understood. So it's written to us to understand that this is how it's going to be. Not because he wanted it to be that way, but because he knew how man would react. Because he knew the end from the beginning. It's something that many, many people have struggled with. But when you understand that context, when you understand that of them, that it's, it's not purposed, but it's written as if it seems like it was purposed. Because we've got these writings over thousands and thousands of years telling us. But it's because he knows the end from the beginning. That's why you can have something that seems like a contradiction when he says, I, I would that all would be saved. You see, he does want that all would be saved, but he knows not all will. And our job is to figure out who they are, right? Because nobody knows who anybody is, we got to share the word, the Lord, the salvation, everything with everybody. Because nobody knows who's going to be saved, who's going pre-trib, who's going to be part, who's going to be left. Nobody knows any of it. Only he does. And so you still share it with everybody. All right? So now, what happens after the Jews are gathered back together? Well, if we know that the Jews in their prophecies that haven't been fulfilled because they were blinded for our sakes, the prophecies that they're waiting for are the prophecies of their enemies being destroyed and then the Lord gathering them back and them rebuilding the third temple. Hello. That's precisely what happens in the, at the end of six years. So the seventh year of seals and the beginning of trumpet judgments, that is exactly what takes place. And it just so happens, it's exactly when they've been gathered back. Funny how that works, right? That's why you see them in Zechariah 8, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, how can we prove this out? Watch what happens. In Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 2, before the decree, what did we say about the Lord? What did we say about the Lord making a decree, right? Making a, a, a covenant, right? A commandment to allow them to go back and rebuild. A, a commandment where the Lord, see, let's just keep going. See, this, this decree, because they're going to what? They're going to start actually rebuilding. But we know that the Lord, I know it's a decree, but we know the Lord is going to make a covenant. There's going to be this decree to allow them to rebuild now, right? But we know at the end, I believe it's going to happen in that seventh seal in that part that's called a half hour of silence in heaven. That this is when the Lord makes the covenant with all nations. You see, the world, because as if, if you're newer, when I was talking about this at the beginning, it's all because of Matthew, the whole world sees the tribulation as only seven years. Most would say, oh, everybody goes pre-trib. There is no one portion and then another portion, even though a harvest field is... 10% goes first, and then the main harvest, and then corners and gleaning. Hello. You know, most people don't understand harvest models of the Lord. And so what happens is they believe that it's going to be the Antichrist who's going to decree to rebuild the temple. And then he's going to be involved in rebuilding it. And then once it's rebuilt, he's going to go in and declare himself God. That's not how it works. You have to watch the, the teachings I'm not going to go into all of that, but you need to watch the teachings to understand that, to realize at no point in history was any temple built by 
an antichrist type figure with Lucifer or Satan leading him. At no point. You see? And in the end, it's no different. We know it's connected to Zerubbabel, whoever the modern day Zerubbabel will be, and the Lord when he comes as Messiah ben Joseph at the end of seals. When he comes destroying what? At the end of seals, he's going to destroy the enemies of Judah that scattered them. That's the Ezekiel 39 war. And then what's going to happen? Well, we saw in Zechariah 8, there he is. They're on Mount Zion. The great multitude come in. He makes a, a, a covenant with, with nations, with the world. And what happens? They start to rebuild, just like Zechariah 8 said. The Lord is there on Mount Zion, and he's telling them that are now gathered back to let their hands be strong because it's time to start rebuilding on the foundation that was laid during seals. So now let's continue in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 2. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass, listen to this, as the chaff. What? Before the day passes the chaff. That sounds familiar too, doesn't it? Well, if we go to Luke chapter 3, what have we revealed about Luke chapter 3? Luke chapter 3 is a prophetic typology of the end of the sixth year of seals. We just, we just recently shared on it. We showed how, <clears throat> I mean, we've shared on it many times over the years, how Luke in order, right? Anybody wants to go look up that video from a few months back, Luke in order, one, two, three, four. We know this relates to the pre, this relates to the 40 days of the Son of Man, this relates to the mid-trib, and this relates to the post. <clears throat> Chapter one, two, three, four. And we just, again, spoke about Joel. Joel, one, two, three, same thing. Joel is like Zephaniah with its three chapters, but Joel's context isn't just isn't directed at Judah. And so we know Joel being the end of the sixth year of seals. Remember what we saw? Blow the trumpet. That's because it'll begin at the Feast of Trumpets, not only to start the 14 years, but to the end the sixth to start the seventh year when the Lord has come on heavenly Mount Zion. And so what are they doing? Sound the trumpet of alarm. That's because the Lord's returning after six years when they see him coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. He's coming on heavenly Mount Zion and it's at the Feast of Trumpets. But what did we also see in this in relation to what we're talking about here? We saw that that the floors shall be full of wheat, okay? And the fats overflowing with wine. When we go to Luke, chapter 3 we see this same thing because it's time for the great multitude rapture which is the wheat coming in where is it where is it uh it's in here somewhere give me a second i should have it easily highlighted there we go so we see it right here in Luke 3, 17, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his granier, but the chaff will he burn with fire unquenchable. Again, if it wasn't the timing of what we've understood, why are these things in Zephaniah showing us these same periods of time? They're having the same conversation, the same context of conversation in each chapter of things that we've already understood and revealed over the years that are coming at these periods of time. Crazy. So as the chaff before the fire, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, you the meek of the earth, which have brought, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Before the decree, right? So before the decree with this rebuilding, before this, the him making his covenant, before the, the chaff is all burnt up, you meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, okay? Which have, 
which did his judgment, which, which were part of his judgment here during seals. Do these things, right? Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid from the day of the Lord's anger. Well, who are those who are going to be closed up and hid at that point? You think the great multitude rapture? You see? This group, the great multitude rapture, the, the Jews that are going to be brought back, gathered back into the land. Now what happens? What happens next? What's going to happen at the end of the six years of seals? What is that Ezekiel 39 war? It's the nations that scattered them. Right? It's all about those nations, the destruction that came upon that came upon Israel and, and Judah, right? And there were ten nations, like the ten horns or like the ten toes. So let's see what Zephaniah now tells us. And in chapter two, starting in verse four, for Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashad at the noonday. And Ekron shall be rooted up. Woe to the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nations of the Kerishites. The word of the Lord is against you. O Canaan, the land of the Philistines, I will even destroy thee, and there shall be no more inhabitant. And the sea coast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds of the flocks. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. See, because they're being brought back. The remnant of Judah. They shall feed thereupon in the houses of Ashkelon. They shall lay down in the evening, and the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the, and the revilings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah. And the breeding uh, of nestles in the salt pits and a perpetual desolation, the residue of my people shall spoil them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. They shall have for their pride because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts, the Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. You Ethiopians, also you shall be slain by my sword, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. And I will make Nineveh a desolation and a dry wilderness. Nineveh is part of Assyria. Okay, That was like, I think, the capital or some of ancient Assyria. So how many places do you have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Ten nations of people that he's going to bring destruction upon who are the enemies of Israel who scattered them. That should sound very familiar to each and every one of us, right? How about Revelation 17? What happened? What did the beast have? The beast had 10 horns. The 10 horns which thou sawest are Ten kings, which have received no kingdom yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These shall have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. This is what we call the first sword, right? This is Ezekiel 39 war. With the ten kings and the beast. And the lamb shall overcome them for his lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with them are called and chosen and faithful. Huh. How about another one? How about Daniel? Chapter 2. We just covered in the last video a bit as well. Right? The, the great image with Nebuchadnezzar. His was the image uh, which was the head of gold. 
we covered what he represents, just like that first attack went 70 years, right? Funny how that works. <laughs> because, oh, I won't go into it. But it's the same connection with the 70 years. He describes it all, and then what does he say? Verse 35, Daniel 2. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass. So we see it, uh, the image had the feet uh, that were of iron and clay and break them in pieces. Now, what were they? They were the toes, right? And listen to what it says. Then was the iron, clay, brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became what? The chaff like the summer threshing floor. Huh. There's that chaff of the summer threshing floor again, and it's the stone. See? Not the little stones who were the workers like Christ, right? But now Jesus, the stone, that small, that strikes the image, and this image that has the ten toes, which is the image of the beast, for which the ten toes are the ten horns, are the same picture of, and he smites the, the, the image as the stone, and it becomes what? A great mountain. So then it becomes a great mountain after this destruction, the great multitude. Judah comes in, this declaration being made, and then what does it equal? Seventh year is now over, and you get to Zechariah chapter 8, and what do you see? The Lord on his holy mountain. It's awesome. It's so awesome. You see, there's no way to get to all these without first, which is why I was saying earlier, it is as exciting as it is to understand the season and time, which I, I know that we know unequivocally now. I know it's been revealed in Scripture. It's now just, is this really the year? And according to Scripture, it does really appear to be revealed as well. That's exciting. Of course it's exciting, and it's something that we're, that we're looking to in this anticipation. Because as watchmen, as people that are diligently seeking the Lord, that love the Lord, that, that are diligent, that are watching and praying, we're not interested in kids getting married, in, in seeing our grandkids be born and grow up. Those things are beautiful and exciting. But compared to being with the Lord in his presence for eternity, that stuff is... I could care less. But while we're living in the world, of course we love them. Of course we want to see those things if they're happening before, before the time of the end. But I don't wish to see those things over the Lord coming and being ready to go be with them. Not a chance. Not even close. So now let's keep going. Luke 17. So, what else did we see in a connection here? I'm actually sad my coffee's done already. Anyways, so, what else do we see? You got it. Sodom and Gomorrah. We have now, in the exact same place where it should take place, a reference of two of these nations being as Sodom and and Gomorrah. Why does that matter to us? Well, let's go have a look. Luke chapter 17. This great place we've broken down many times over the years. We know it like the back of our hands, right? Luke 17, 24. This is the Lord talking about the end of days. He, they're asking him, when is he coming? When's, when's it going to happen? When's going to be the kingdom and everything else, right? In verse 24, he starts with the end. He says, For as the lightning that lighteth out of one part of heaven and shineth unto the other part of heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. Singular. This is the conversation you read in Matthew's discourse. Right? For those that don't know it, you see it in Matthew 28, and you see it in Matthew 24. And of course, the reason it's important to go in 24 is so people can understand where it is and why it's there. Listen to what it says. Verse 27. 
For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, you see, and this is the Lord coming, and look what they're doing, sound of the trumpet. <laughs> Why? Because it's at the Feast of Trumpets. Hello. 14 years. Starts at the Feast of Trumpets. Well, there's the above, and then it starts at the Feast of Trumpets. End of six years starts the seventh year, Feast of Trumpets. End of the seventh year starts the eighth year, Feast of Trumpets. End of the 13th year, sixth year of trumpet judgments. Seventh year starts at the Feast of Trumpets. Final year goes Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets. The final 14th year. And then 10 days later is the Day of Atonement and the sounding of the Jubilee for the millennial reign and the final Jubilee. This is the Lord coming, feet down on the Mount of Olives, at the 14th year, the final year when he returns feet down. So when we're coming to Luke and you understand that, you can see he's talking about when he's coming feet down in his day at the end. But you want to know how you get more clarity? In verse 25, he says, but first. So what I'm about to tell you next, he's saying, comes before I come in my day as lightning. So what does it say? But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days. See, it went from saying day to now days. For the days of the Son of Man, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, and were given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. What's this a picture of? Luke's discourse. The 40 days of the Son of Man. When he said he's going to fulfill as Jonah did, warning Jerusalem, of this compassing about that's coming at the end of 50 days and their destruction. He's warning about it as the Son of Man for 40 days. He is the white horse rider coming after the wedding. The pre-trip bride goes, seven-day wedding. He returns on the eighth day, and he's here for 40 days. When the 40 days are over, he leaves after three days, anointing of the Holy Ghost at the true Pentecost, and then Feast of Trumpets next day, the day and hour no one knows, is the first attack coming on Israel, okay? He is coming first as the Son of Man for 40 days. Then what happens? Well, then we know he's coming at the end of seals. This whole conference, conversation of Zephaniah chapter 2 is the end of the sixth year of seals, okay? All throughout that seventh year period. And what have we explained it was? Over the years, we've explained to you that it's the story of Lot. So then he says, likewise also. So he's now giving us another reference point. This was him coming after the pre-trib for 40 days where he's going to be with those remnant workers like Smyrna that we were talking about in the beginning. And then he's gone for 40 days. They remain to work during seals. They bring in, they, they help bring in the greatest revival in human history in the midst of chaos. And then what happens? The end of seals, the end of the sixth year of seals. And so look at what he says. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, listen to this, they bought, they sold. Funny how they bought and they sold is here in the story of Lot. You know why? Because this is the group that goes during seals. When you go read about the mark of the beast in Revelation 13, it says that nobody could buy or sell lest they had the mark. It's during the time of Lot. And look at what it says. It even gives us the reference of buying and selling. But the same day Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Hello. This is. The group that was during seals, buying and selling until the end, and it will be as it was with Sodom. And after, and at that point, it's when the Son of Man is revealed. What do you mean he's revealed? Look at the end of the sixth seal. They're all freaking out. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. This is when he's coming at the Ezekiel 39 war. 
He destroys the ten horns that come out to fight against him. We read about this as well. We've covered it many times in Second Esdras. And so we see it everywhere. You just saw it in uh, Daniel chapter 2. He's that stone that comes, it destroys them, and it becomes a great mountain. That same timing is connected to this group of Lot in the time that they were there during seals of buying and selling. And the end of it is related to Sodom or Sodom and Gomorrah. So where else do we see this? Let me show you something. Remember our chapters to years? If it's related to this same period of time, see the seventh year of seals, right? There he is being seen at the end of the sixth year, coming on heavenly Mount Zion, destroy the enemies. There's your seventh year of seals. In our chapters to years, that brings us to Genesis chapter 14. We go to Genesis chapter 14, and guess what we see? Let's go to Genesis 14 right here. It's much more clear. Much sharper. So Genesis chapter 14. And here we see it, starting in verse 8. And there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adam and the king of this one and the king of Bela, the same as Zor. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Sidom um, with Kamar, the king of Elam, and Tidal. You see all the nations coming together, you see? Like the ten kings. And it says, The vale of Sodom, son of the sand pits, uh, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and there fell, and they that remained fled to the mountains. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's your battle, <coughs> excuse me, against Sodom and Gomorrah at the rescue of Lot. What, what comes? Well, look what comes next. Melchizedek. Melchizedek, the high priest and king. Melchizedek, the high priest and king. We know from Psalms 110 that that's exactly the same story of Christ showing up when he's now going to be seated at the right hand of the Father. He's going to rule <clears throat> out of Zion in the midst of his enemies, and he's going to be a high priest and king after the order of Melchizedek. It's all about Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's at the end of the sixth year of seals. And what was Zephaniah telling us? He was showing us the exact same thing. That it would be as Sodom and Gomorrah. All of these things lined up with the ten, all of it equaling the exact same period of time that we've been sharing about. The end of the six year seals. Zephaniah in order. Let's keep going. Zephaniah. In the last verse, it says, and this is where I went off the beaten path a bit. Well, connected, but in much deeper area. In verse 15. It says, this is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. Now is she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in. Everyone that passes by her shall hiss and wag his hand. And I thought, hmm. This rejoicing city, carelessly going about, saying, I am the one and there's none beside me, now becoming a desolation and a place where beasts lie down? This, of course, gets me to go into Revelation 17. And as I go into Revelation 17, because remember, the, the woman is riding the beast. The beast that has seven heads, of which the eighth comes from the seventh, has ten horns. And the woman is riding the beast. And she's responsible for the kings of the earth that have committed fornication. These are the ones that have committed fornication. 
So all the kings of the earth that have committed fornication and those who may commit fornication, right? The people. Look at this word for fornication. It's only used eight times. And I could have sworn the word fornication is used much more than eight times in Scripture. And so what do we know about the woman in Revelation chapter 17? Without going into all the details, well, we see the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So we know she was definitely there during seals. If not all of seals, certainly by, you know, that that mid-ish two and a half year time frame. And what do we know happens? Well, if the ten horns are the ten kings and they're with the beast and they're going to make war with the lamb and the lamb is going to destroy them, having overcome them, then how do you account for what comes next? In Revelation 17, 15. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sits are people and multitudes, multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns that thou saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Which means what? Which means if they're going to do this, if the ten horns are going to do this to her, they obviously have to do it before the Lord destroys them. Huh. So there's something late seals. This has got to be late seals. Because the ten kings are about to make war with the lamb and he's going to overcome them. Yet then, so what you're seeing, it's not a continuation of the story. He now jumps back saying, and the ten horns. You see, obviously it can't be after he's defeated them in battle. It's got to be these are the ten horns being described. But now going back a little bit earlier, you see, and it says, For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city. See, it's a, it's a city. It, it's a place. It's not a, I don't think it'll be a physical person, but it relates to the city. This great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So this city is going to be destroyed. This woman, this great city, which reigns over the kings of the earth. Well, what does this woman do? She makes them drunk, right, with the wine of her fornication. This is, So we've got this wine and the destruction, and it says... You know, uh, in, in chapter 18, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Again, like I said, I'm not fully complete in all of it, but you're going to see we've got much more to go into in this. But you got to remember, there is something separate for the nations that have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You see, there it is again. For the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. But what we're finding out, and what we've actually known for a bit, it's just a matter of the breaking down of timing, is when all these nations drank of the wine of her fornication. It had to be during seals. Right? And the ten kings are there with it. With the beast, the ten kings, and the woman's riding them. Before the ten, before the ten horns, I mean, turn on her. And if the ten horns are killed and they're, they're overcome by the lamb at the end of seals, then she must have been fallen, fallen by the end of seals. Right? By the end of that sixth year of seals. Which means all the nations that drank of the wine of her fornication would have done so during seals because that's when the abundance for them is. Right? This is something we shared. This goes back even to the a couple videos ago when we were talking about um, Joseph and that the, the seven years of abundance, the seven years of plenty, Joseph was in the land of his enemies. 
You see, he was in the land of his affliction. So the seven years of seals, we've shown that the, the abundance of corn was all about abundance of wheat, which relates to the great multitude rapture of the spring wheat. So they're in this abundance because it's also an abundance during the time of seals, but for the enemy. They're the ones that have taken over control of everything. They're the ones that the Lord has given it over to, to bring about his time of the end, to bring about his judgment. We know they're all Arab, although there's going to be crazy war going out everywhere. Nation against nation, keep people against people, neighbor against neighbor. But at that point when the beast comes and begins his real power time starting, then you have to expect that the woman has been there, the woman's riding them, right? The ten horns are there. They'll receive power at some point a little bit, maybe a little later on into seals. This is when they're drinking of of the of the her the the fornication they're committing and drinking the wine of her wrath in the abundance of her delicacies, because the seven years of seals is the abundance time for the enemy. The Arabs, right? The the Muslims. The Muslim belief is going to take over the world. Don't you can't you see what's going on right now in the world? Look at how the Lord has given people over to, to vile thoughts of siding with an enemy like Hamas and all this Mus these Muslim groups. Right at a period of time when it's all building and will come into their quote-unquote favor. Do you guys remember the, the Albert Pike and Three World Wars? You know, fermentum against this and the first one, second one, and the third one would be against the Muslims. And it'll get so destructive and so violent. It'll be so, so desperate and despairing because World War III will, will go on for at least two and a half years before one will stand up. There will be such desperation. And that's when the beast will stand up. That's when they will come and it'll be to worship the beast. And he will be the Muslim. It's this group of, of these kingdoms of the earth that will drink of the wine of the wrath of this nation and will commit this fornication with her. So it's got to end. There, there has to be a destruction of her at the end of seals. But is it possible she can come back? So from this, it takes me and it led me into Revelation chapter 2 with the seven churches. This was something that crossed my mind a couple months ago in pondering this, and I never went further into it. Remember at Pergamum? What is Pergamum? Pergamum, you see, we know it in our, in our seven churches in the Re Revelation of the end of days. Pergamum is that point of about two and a half years into tribulation, right? Into that two and a half years of seals. Which is Matthew's sorry, which is Mark's discourse when they have to then flee into the wilderness. And when they flee into the wilderness, we know it's Mark's discourse because it's the time of the mark of the beast buying and selling. You see? So I decide to look more into Pergamum and to see this this connection to this period of time. So we see uh, even in what he says to the church of Pergamum, write these things, saith he, which has the sharp sword with two edges. Because that's the sword he's bringing against them, right? I know where thy dwellest, where thou dwellest, uh, where Satan's seat is. Even in those days, wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr. What, it, what, is, the, what is the woman doing? The martyrs of Christ right? She had the martyrs, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. What's happening during this point of, of seals now? It's time for the martyrs. This is when they're going to go after the Christians when the beast gets his power to continue. What was Constantine a picture of? Constantine was a picture of a beast, an antichrist type. It says, now listen to this. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak 
to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Okay, the children of Israel, the Gentiles also grafted in. To eat things sacrificed unto idols. Remember, there's no eating or drinking unless you're going to bow to the idol worship of the beast. And to commit, look at that, fornication. This fornication is part of the same one that's only used eight times directly related to the woman Babylon. But this caught my attention. Balaam and Balak. And look at where the reference of this period of time is. So what we have is the typology of the seven churches all throughout history. In the Old Testament was played out over like 2,500 years. From the New Testament in the is until the moment of the pre-trib. And then you've got the is to come. We've revealed it, right? We, we've got it. It's in our book. We've got videos on it. The revelation of the seven churches of the end of days. It'll play out during 50 days and 14 years. This took 2,500 years. This took 2,000 years. The typology of all of that will play out, as I've said many times, in 50 days and 14 years. That's why Mark and Matthew's discourse say it'll be a time worse than it ever was in human history since creation. Because the craziness that went on during both of these times will be amplified in, in more condensed periods of time. So, look at what it says. The wilderness period, and it talks about the book of Numbers. So, interesting enough, I go look up Balaam and Balak. And look at what we find. We go into Balaam and Balak, and I start going into Numbers. It's all, look at that. It's all numbers, 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 and then it goes on a little bit further. The focus is all the book of Numbers. So I go to Numbers 24. And in Numbers chapter 24, we see Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel biding in his tents according to their tribes. Well... What do we know this time is? What is this exact time <clears throat> connected with, <coughs> excuse me, with Balaam, Baal, the Constantine type in the wilderness because it's Mark's time when they have to flee into the wilderness. It's the equivalent of numbers. And what does he see them? Starts off by him seeing them dwelling in tents in the wilderness according to their tribes. That's exactly when they're going to be in the wilderness. Pretty wild, right? The connections are, are awesome. So, and then it goes on to say, um, it's all about Balak and Balaam. <coughs> Excuse me. The Lord is, is speaking to him and showing him these things. They're refusing to do it. Like, it, it's happening, but then the other one isn't. All this stuff breaks out. And then we get to Numbers 24, verse 14. And now, behold, I go... Unto my people, come therefore, and I will advise thee what this people shall do to thy people in what? Look at that. What are the chances? This is the verse, the, the chapter that I go to out of all the books and all the chapters and numbers. And then he says, I'm now going to show you what's going to happen to your people in the end of days. Listen to this. Let's go to it. In Esau, Numbers, chapter 24. Oh, yeah, even I, I skipped verse 8. Look at verse 8. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Ta-da! A what? A wild bull. An ox, remember? When the Lord returns, he's coming as Messiah ben Joseph, Ephraim, right? You can say Messiah ben Joseph or Messiah ben Ephraim, which is represented as a bull. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones. That's exactly what we read. He's going to break their bones. We see that, I think it was in Daniel chapter 2, when he comes as that stone. So now, what shall happen in the latter days, okay? The end times. 
<laughs> I love it when it gets so clear. And it says, uh, okay, you were in a trance, saw the vision, falling into a trance with your eyes open. Now listen to this. Verse 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. Are you ready? There shall come a star out of Jacob, comma, and a scepter shall rise up out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and shall destroy all the children of Seth and Edom shall be a possession and so da, 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 right? Out of Jacob, out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion. So what's coming? A star of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And Jacob shall come, he that shall have dominion. Well, let me start with this. If we go into Daniel chapter 2, we see this timing of Daniel chapter, oops, not Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7. What do we know about the end of seals? Okay? We know who the fourth beast is. That is the beast of Revelation. There's ten horns. It's going to be until the Ancient of Days did sit. This is the end of the sixth seal. This is him coming on heavenly Mount Zion, that stone coming. We see until he's destroyed concerning the other beasts. They had their dominions taken away. Here's the interpretation. Oh, no, no, wait. Um, verse 13, Daniel 7. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before and there was given him dominion. There's one. Now, watch this. Remember what we just saw, okay? So a star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter out of Israel, and he shall smite, okay? We know it's connected to the end of the six year seals, which is, the end of the sixth year is the seals. The end of the sixth year, not the seventh. The end of the sixth year is <clears throat> the end of Thyatira. Okay? It's Thyatira. So here we were talking about Balaam and Balak, the knowing where Satan's seed is and the martyrs. We know that the woman is connected with the martyrs, having the blood of the martyrs. But there's the doctrine of Balaam being taught by Balak and the committing fornication. Who are the ones that get people to commit fornication? It's the harlot. It's the harlot. Remember, we're going to look into this because this word for fornication is used a lot more than eight times. This is why I was saying in the beginning, when you get this, when you use a program like this, and you have the Strong's Concordance at your fingertips, everything opens. Your understanding of Scripture, <coughs> by using something like this, will drastically, ten times at least, increase your understanding of Scripture. And this is, this is another one of those things in relation to fornication. So, we see this, that obviously, during this time of Balaam with Balak, they're fleeing into the wilderness, or there they are in the wilderness. We know it's connected to when they flee in the wilderness. But we know there are some that are going to be part of the eating and drinking. The same time as Sodom and Gomorrah. The same time as the beast. When it's time for the mark to receive the, the eating and drinking. So they can't buy or sell. That will commit this fornication. And then it says... Um, so we know it's connected to the the woman. And it goes on and say, Repent or else I will come upon thee and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Of course. Because when he comes at the end of the six year of seals, he's coming with that sword. Just as I mentioned. And then look what he says. In verse 17, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Why, out of all the seven churches, is hidden manna spoken about here? You got it. Because they're going to be in the wilderness. They're going to be in the wilderness, starving. Nope. 
the Lord's going to take care of them. They're going to have of the hidden manna being provided while they're in the wilderness. Now, this then takes us in further going into Thyatira. <clears throat> so listen what happens as we now go into Thyatira. Thyatira, in the end of the church of Thyatira, is the picture of taking us to the end of the sixth year of seals. And it says, the church in Thyatira write these things, saith the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Huh. That's the same conversation we saw in, in um, Daniel chapter 7 as well. So now look at what it says. This is where it gets interesting. More interesting. Verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou suffereth that woman, Jezebel. Okay? This false teacher woman, Jezebel, which we know is the Jezebel, right, with King Ahab. Okay? And it says, which, called her, which calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. There it is again. So we see it in Revelation 17 about her. We see it in Revelation 18 about her. We see it in Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse, I think, 14, and then 20. You see? To teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. You see? So who is, who, who is responsible for it? Up here. If this is the time of the beast, who's riding the beast? The woman. So who's the one getting them to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit fornication? See, this is to who? The children of Israel. That's to the children of Israel. What does it say with Thyatira? What does it say about Jezebel who's going after them? Who's Jezebel going after? She's going after the Lord's servants. Guys, this is the remnant workers. This is her going after the remnant workers to commit fornication, to get them to change from, from serving the Lord, whatever that deception is. And it says, and I gave her space to repent of her. Look at that. Now it changes to different fornication. Okay? This specific one, we're going to go into this one. We're going to look at them all, but we're going to specifically go into that as well. Um, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her. Listen to what it says. I will cast her into a bed. <clears throat> okay? She is going to be cast into a bed. Look at that. For sleep? Or is it is it the just simply this adulterous... Uh, um, a uh, uh, show of going into a bed or like a couch, that type of thing. Okay? Or is it that this couch is her, see, having given her this space to repent, and she repented not. Remember, the ten kings turn on her. So there has to be some sort of destruction that comes against her. And here we are at the end of the six year of seals time frame, and it says, I will cast her into a bed for sleep because she, the, the destruction. And then listen to what it says. I, I, I say this accentuated so that you realize what it says. She is being cast into a bed. Is everybody else that's about to be mentioned being cast into a bed? Nope. Comma and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. So is she cast into a bed as in a sleep because she's been destroyed at the end of the sixth year? And then those that committed adultery with her are now going to go into what? Great tribulation. Ah, you see? 
And it says, and I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins and hearts. Okay? So why, what, what's the big deal here? Is, is he going to kill all of them? Or is she being killed? And the Lord in this battle with the ten nations, obviously they will have taken the beast because those ten kings are with the beast. So then what is he going to do? Then he's going to kill her children too. So it, it really appears that the destruction is here. The destruction of Babylon is at the end of the sixth year of seals as well. In that time frame. But there's going to be a group that sided with her that committed this adultery with her that are going to be what? Cast into great tribulation. Great tribulation is the second half of trumpets. You could probably even say all of trumpets, but really it's that second half once the pit is open. And that might tell us more of the story. But now, don't forget what we were also talking about in this connection. In Numbers chapter 24, that began with the story with Balaam and Balak that was in uh, um, uh, Pergamum. It was connected to this time when the, when the judgment will come upon all of their people and it will be at the time of the end. So they're being shown, he was being shown here the time of the end. And he said when it comes, it's going to come from a star of Jacob and a scepter that shall rise out of Israel. That shall smite them. <clears throat> so, let's go see if there's a connection from Pergamum with Balaam, right? With Balaam and Balak, which are connected to the beast, which caused people to eat these things, sacrifice, and to commit fornication, right? Again, connected to Sodom and Gomorrah and buying and selling. Listen to what it said next. <laughs> if we know it's connected to the woman and the woman is Jezebel and she's seducing also the servants as these guys are connected to doing it against the world of the church, right? Or you can say the world in general, but really the world of the church to seduce them with her. She's going into a bed and they're going to be thrown into great tribulation. Listen to what it says. We go down to verse Revelation 2, verse 25. But that which you have already, hold fast till I come. Remember what it said with, with um, uh, um, Luke 17, right? With uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, specifically Sodom there. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, meaning their end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter, they shall be broken to shivers. What was the rod going to do? Destroy them. But it also said there was a star. Verse 28, and I will give him the morning star. Hello. 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 <laughs> Look at that connection, right? Exactly. Exactly. This period that we had from the book of in, in the timing of the seven churches in relation to the end of days, bringing us to Numbers uh, 24, revealing what's going to happen to his people, this group in the end of days that have come against them, and when he shows them this period of the end of days, it's connected to Thyatira, which brings us to the end of the Dark Ages, which is this period of time, the second half, the 42 months of seals from about two and a half years into seals when, when the beast gets his time to continue to the end of the sixth year of seals before they're brought in in the seventh year great multitude rapture 
the Thyatira church, the very end of Thyatira is the end of the sixth year of seals. We've been teaching that for a few years. And what is the very end of the sixth year of seals? When he brings destruction upon all those that brought destruction and scattered Jerusalem, that scattered Judah, that are connected not only with the woman, but also with Balaam and Balak, that connect to the, to the, to the beast, and the beast with them has what? Has the ten horns, the ten kings, the ten nations that will turn on the woman and bring about her destruction for which the Lord then brings about the destruction on the ten kings. And what did we see in Numbers? The revelation of the end of days that when the Lord is going to do it against his, against that, his group of people, the enemy's group of people, it's going to be with the rod who's coming and the star. Told you guys. We've understood. We have understood. And the clarity just gets more and more and more clear. Now, let's look into this woman. Because this woman is connected, of course, to Jezebel. What can we what can we get from this oops from this understanding of Jezebel? Do we see it also connected? To being this period of seals? Well, if it, if it's going to be, of course. Right? Because of where she is. So let's go look. And look, see what we can see in Jezebel. Okay? It's all throughout the book of Kings, right? Again, 1st, 2nd Kings. Whoops. 1st, 2nd Kings, it's all throughout it. Okay? So we know the period of time. Because, first of all, look at what it says. In 1st Kings 18:19. It says, now, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450 and the prophets of the groves, 400, which ate at Jezebel's table. What do we know happens? We know, of course, it's the time of Elijah. And this is very important to understand that it's the time of Elijah. Because we know the Elijah type is one of the worker representatives as the John the Baptist, as Moses, right? So as John the Baptist didn't get to take him into the promised land, was killed. Moses didn't get to take him in the promised land, died. And Joshua came and took him over for John. Jesus shows up and Jesus is the one then. And then we got Elijah. Elijah didn't get killed. He ends up going up in a whirlwind like it's like a group of those at the end of seals who didn't die, but go up in the whirlwind in the great multitude rapture. So we know this period of time connected to to uh, Jezebel and it being with with um, Elijah being there. OK, so. We go into first Kings 19. And we see the story. Right, we've all gone through. We've seen the story of Jezebel uh, uh, when Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Right, like all of those false prophets. Remember what happens in Mark's discourse, uh, da -da 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 -da, Mark thirteen. So remember in Luke's discourse, there is no mention. Of false prophets or false uh, uh, false, and false Christ. When you go into Mark's discourse, the first half, there's no mention of false Christs or false prophets. That's because this group, they don't show up on the scene until the beast gets his power to continue 42 months, which is the abomination standing where it ought not or placed where it ought not, which has to do with the mark of the beast. When that happens... It'll be a time worse than it was in all of human history since the creation. And who shows up? Now you got your false Christs and your false prophets. Who's dealing with these false prophets and Jezebel during this time? The Elijah types, right? Whether it's a Moses and an Elijah who head their groups, we know it's the two from Luke on the road to Emmaus and he has a meal with them. I believe those two represent a type of 
the good side of Dan as as um as uh, um <clears throat> as uh I could see it in my mind's eye. Uh, Aquila. So as as an Aquila, the good side of Dan, and then you've got um, the other side being Ephraim. So whether it's an Ephraim or a Dan side, this Elijah type is the represent representative as one of those. And what does he do? He slays the prophets. And what is the period of time? It has to be the second half of seals. It has to be the second half because this is when their portion is. And it's precisely the time when they show up at the time of the mark of the beast. And then you've got your false Christs and false prophets in this period in relation to Mark's discourse. <coughs> so here we are. He's slaying these false prophets. All this stuff breaks out with them. He's now upset, right? And he's complaining to the Lord as well. And he says, um, uh, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even only I, am left. And he saith, go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord will pass by. Okay, and there's this great shaking and everything else. Almost like what we're seeing here is this period of transition from the end of seals. Okay, that we're coming like to the end of that sixth year of seals. And watch how we can show this. Okay, let's go into 1 Kings 19 and listen to this conversation that's then had. So we come to verse 16 and it says, so actually let's start in 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazel, Haz Hazel over the kingdom of Syria. And listen to this. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, thou shalt anoint to be king over Israel. And Elias, which is Elisha, right? I mean, Elisha, the son of Sephat, of this one shall thou anoint prophet in thy room okay in thy stead what do we know happens who do you think jehu and elisha are a picture of jehovah is he right jehovah is he right self the same and then you have elisha and elisha is the one, what is it, uh, supplication, but he gets the double portion, remember? He gets the double portion, and is also the name of the son, a son of King David. What do you think this is representing right here? We've talked about this in part in the past. And in fact, even in a recent video, when does the king of Israel show up? When does the king of Israel show up? Well, what happens when we get to the end of this period, which is this period of, of Jezebel, what happens at the seventh year of seals, which is represented by Sardis? The Lord having come on heavenly Mount Zion now. Destroyed the enemies and all of that. It represents the Reformation in our modern day. And it's called what? The period of Israel's kings. Oh, and it's in first and second kings. <laughs> you think it's by chance? We haven't really gone into these in the Old Testament, you know. We hadn't gone into this connection in numbers. We've done it with Exodus, but this connection with numbers and first kings. We hadn't really touched on these things before. But we just recently spoke how we know the seventh year of seals into the first half of trumpets is all about Israel's kings. Israel's kings. I thought there's really just one king over Israel. Well, there is. But what are you seeing here? Two of them are being anointed, right? And it's Elijah, Elisha who's getting the, the anointing over Elisha. I mean, uh, Elisha is getting the anointing from Elijah. And Jehu is the one to be anointed king over Israel. 
we know there's two. It's funny how that works, right? Isn't that exactly what we get in Zechariah chapter 6? Zechariah chapter 6, the end of the sixth year of seals. And what do we see? We see Joshua, <coughs> which has the crowns. He's high priest and king. And it says, speak and speak unto him, saying, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. That's Zerubbabel. All you got to do is go read chapter 4 of Zechariah because the one who laid the foundation was told that he would build the temple. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. Who's going to be ruling? Zerubbabel. What? Zerubbabel is going to be ruling when Jesus is here? Ah. Jesus will be ruling too in a different way, but they'll do it together. And he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. Because Yeshua Jesus is the high priest and king. He is above the branch. He is above Zerubbabel who is overseeing the rebuilding of the temple. Who, who, whom also laid the foundation during seals. And how many did we have? Two? We had two of them. Jehu as king over Israel. And Elijah, Elisha, who is taken over for Elijah. Do you know that what we shared in, in over the years is the Elisha type is really the one who is like Christ. That is, what, and what I mean by that is the typology. In the typology of these two, you have one who is king over Israel. Yes, Christ is also king and high priest. But we just saw who's going to be there with them, having rebuilt it and rule with them. That's going to be Zerubbabel, which would mean Elisha, which we know Elisha, as the Joshua Yeshua type, is the one taking over. He's taking over from the Elijah. And he, he represents receiving what? The double portion. We know some pretty crazy things about this that I'm not going to get into. One that takes over from one and then finishes the story. It's pretty crazy. And so if we've got a Moses type and we've got an Elijah type, both during seals, and we see that the, the Moses type dies like the John the Baptist and the other one as the Elijah is there and the Elisha takes over from him as the Joshua takes over from Moses. It's the same person. It's the same typology of person one is the story of moses and elisha and, and uh um joshua takes over one is the story of of um elijah and at the end he doesn't take taste death and goes up in the whirlwind like the rapture group and elisha takes over both of them are a picture of christ here they both are two of them being anointed as king and prophet, as those being who will rule together, directly connected to the same time at the end of seals. And look at what the Lord says. And he's, yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel. And the Lord leaves for himself 7,000 in Israel. Wasn't that fascinating? Again, something we've spoken on in the past. Romans chapter 11. We see this group that's with them. So we see it right here. In Romans 11, starting in verse 2, God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew what he not, what the scripture saith of Elijah. How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets. They dig down thine altars 
and I am left alone. The exact same thing we were just reading. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Hmm. That's really interesting. Again, showing this period of the end of seals with a group that haven't bowed down the knee to Baal. And it's during the time of Elijah and the Lord saying, I have reserved to myself 7,000. And what is he? He is a, a typology in that anointing with Elisha. And what does he say? He's reserved for himself 7,000. And what do we know happens at the end of the sixth year of trumpets? Right? The end of the 13th year of tribulation. Right at the again when it happens. And then the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. What do we see? Revelation eleven thirteen, The same hour was there a great earthquake and a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe, which is the sixth trumpet, has passed. The 7,000. Remember what happened? They, they essentially, they don't all die, right? During seals. The remnant workers don't all die. Right? That remnant seals, remnant group of workers, they don't all die. But we read in Revelation 20, that we know is this group of Smyrna who's going to take part in the first resurrection who won't be hurt by the second death, that it would appear they all had to die <coughs> to be able to take part in the resurrection. Well, what did God say? He reserved from them 7,000 for himself. And where do they die? At the end of the sixth trumpet. They were killed in the earthquake for his purpose, for his glory, that the remnant would be affrighted, having seen 7,000 men die, which were his, and they all turn and give glory to the God of heaven. Pretty wild. Pretty wild how we're able to see and find these connections through this. Awesome, awesome stuff. You see, remember, here's the time when Jehu is taking over, right? So look what happened with Jehu. So um, now master of Jezreel, Jehu wrote to command the chief men of Samaria to hunt down and to kill all the royal princes. Uh, they did so, and the next day they piled the 70 heads <laughs> in two heaps outside the city gate. You see, this is something... Now, when you think of this, you think, oh, my goodness. Like, how barbaric, how crazy, right? Remember what I said earlier? The end of days in the discourses of Mark says it'll be worse than it ever was since the beginning of, uh, of creation. And then Matthew's, which is mid-trumpets, says it will be a time worse than even that and never will be any worse after this. This is nothing compared to what's coming. Yikes. As Jehu commanded, Ahab's entire family was slain. Okay? Was slain when he takes over, when, when the victory comes, you see? So we saw that in that revelation. Okay. So as we look in this in relation to the fornication, and now after having gone down that whole trail to understand this exact period it's talking about, <clears throat> to see the changeover from the end of the sixth year of seals, from the from the Elijah to the Elisha taking over, from the Moses to the uh, Joshua taking over. We then see, or are going into this word for fornication. You see, fornication is in many places. In fact, in the Old Testament, the word fornication itself isn't in many places. Isaiah 23 is something we'll probably go into another day. But look at where we see it. Matthew, Matthew. In this case, there's no Mark. 
And there's no Luke. Do I have another place? Look, if you type in fornications, then you have Matthew and you have Mark. But no Luke. We'll, we'll see that a little bit further. Then we go in and we see all of these places with the word fornication. Are they all directly related to the woman, right? To, to Babylon, right? Something is coming. Something, it's, it's obviously, this is why the importance of digging into the, the Septuagint and finding these word differences. Let me show you this first connection by going into Jude, without touching my timer, Jude, of course, chapter one, there's only one chapter. And where was it? In verse 7. Jude chapter 1, verse 7. Listen to this. <laughs> Even as Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Just so happens the connection to Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction of this fornication in relation to the end of seals. Love it when a plan works out. Watch this. Now we keep going. <clears throat> of course, we then see it in Revelation. Interesting that in all of the the chapters in relation uh, the two chapters in relation to the seven churches. So out of all the seven churches, it just so happens it's the one that represents when the beast comes at Pergamum, and the other one, the other two are related to Jezebel, the woman who causes them to commit fornication. And is directly related to the beast, uh, uh, to, to Mystery Babylon. So we see all these other ones, but th there's not, uh, when you look at it like this, it's really to show that the word is actually found everywhere. Okay? Fornication, fornications. In fact, when we go into the definition of the word, which is the 4202, we still see it in all of these places. <clears throat> Matthew, 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 Mark. There it is. See, this one covers fornications, which is in two places in the Greek, and everywhere else that it's fornication. But everywhere? No. Because that word for fornication in 21 of Revelation 2 is the other one. Where are the other ones? Where are the other ones? What about the ones directly related to Jezebel? Remember how we saw there was only eight of them? Well, here they are. There's only eight times in seven verses. We have one about fleeing fornication. Clearly, when we're looking through it with end time eyes, we're seeing this flee of fornication, which is clearly a time during seals. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and 20,000? Fornication. Picture of the time during seals. And now look at this. This word for fornication connected to Jezebel, connected to the seven churches in the revelation of the end of days, is in chapter 2, verse 14, with Balaam and Balak that are getting them to commit to it. For who? with all the children of Israel. Then we have, with Jezebel, we have in verse 20, we have the one where she's trying to seduce the servants. Remember, she's, she's covered with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And within Thyatira is the story of martyrs. Look what else we see. <clears throat> Revelation 17, 2, Revelation 18, 3, and Revelation 18, 9. Exactly the places related to her. 
with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. For all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Remember, that's because their abundance is during the time of seals. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication, lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Guys, I believe it must be connected to the end of seals with her destruction. But can she come back? <clears throat> is it possible that she comes back? Right? Is it possible that Babylon comes back? Of course it is. Because the pit is going to be open, remember? At the fifth trumpet, the pit is going to be opened, which is about mid-trumpets, about ten and a half years into tribulation. The pit is going to be opened, and all sorts of things are going to be coming out of the pit. I'm sure the demons, the or the ones that are that sided with Babylon, maybe they're the ones coming out of the pit. Because remember, the ones coming out of the pit are coming out with the beast. Remember that? They're coming out with the beast. It says in Revelation 11, and when they shall have finished their testimony, <coughs> the two witnesses, which is mid-trumpets, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and kill them. When he's coming out of the bottomless pit, it's not just him. We can see the locusts and all that other stuff that come out of the bottomless pit. Is this the possibility of Babylon reemerging in that final portion of trumpets? So that then the final destruction of the bold judgments is at that seventh year of trumpet judgments. That's the piece that I'm looking to, to, to dig into and discern more. But the evidence so far that I'm finding is that her fornication that she's causing them all is happening during seals in the midst, in the midst of the abundance for the Muslim time with their Mahdi and false prophet and all of that. This is the time of their abundance, and it's the children of Israel, and it's the servants. And what did we see <coughs> with Thyatira? When she's being put into the bed, comma, and those who fornicated with her are what? Going to be brought into great tribulation. So it may not be that they're coming out of the pit, but that they haven't all died at the end of seals, because we see in Psalms 110, the Lord, when he comes as that high priest and king, as that Melchizedek, right? The, the Joshua Yeshua, the, the, the Elisha taking over portion, the, the, the uh, um, Messiah Ben Joseph Ephraim, when he comes as the ox, <clears throat> excuse me, he's ruling, still it says, in the midst of his enemies. So even though, a, a covenant is being made at the very end of seals. We know this covenant will hold until mid-trumpets when the pit is open. You see? So at that point, when we know that the, the covenant that he made with all nations is broken in one day, as Zechariah chapter 11 says, because the pit is opened, then could it be because he was still ruling in the midst of his enemies that those who had the mark would still be there, right? Not everybody's dead. He didn't kill everybody that had the mark of the beast at that point. So he's still ruling in the midst of his enemies. So if they're going to be thrown into great tribulation, the great tribulation is definitely trumpets, but more specifically mid-trumpets when the pit is opened. Make sense? So we'll find out. We'll keep digging into this. I know a bunch of us will, and we'll keep digging in to see how much further this takes us um, to, to bring about that, that final piece with Babylon. Is she really 
finished at the end of seals the six year of seals um and then then the rest that that sided with her which become those nations which will be gathered at the final battle at the end this is why we know that not everybody who took the mark of the beast is killed at the end of seals they're gonna the lord is still here ruling in the midst of his enemies but then we know that when the beast comes back there'll be all those that were siding with the beast and of course satan will have been cast down at that point it'll be absolute chaos that's why mark's discourse says that'll be even worse time than the one at mark's point and then it'll never be any worse than that ever again and that takes it to the end of the 13th year of tribulation or the sixth year of trumpets and the lord returns feet down on the mount of olives like we see in zechariah chapter 14. then he deals with what well then he deals with the beast again after those two and a half years and satan gets bound and the false prophet so the beast and false prophet are cast alive in the lake of fire and then it's the destruction when all of those nations will be gathered together and that's the battle of the wine press of the treading of the grapes which is the wrath of almighty god right of the treading of the grapes wrath so now let's bring this to an end see i told you it goes a lot further in chapter two of Zeph of zephaniah because it just opened up a whole bunch now listen to this this is where we're bringing it to an end it's not quite as uh far-reaching in chapter three i believe this wall right here is the seventh wall uh sorry is the um the third woe so those that don't know if you haven't studied uh this a lot you'll find it in revelation chapter eight the seven trumpets start with four trumpets and then the last three are called woe 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 the fifth trumpet is a woe the sixth trumpet is a woe and the seventh trumpet is a woe i believe what we're seeing in zephaniah chapter three knowing that now it's judgment on jerusalem and the nations you would think well why judgment on jerusalem again well because some have gone away some some have backslidden and have fallen back and they've gone away and so jerusalem is going to begin there i mean uh the judgment is going to begin at jerusalem and then all the nations so knowing this that the timing is the first destruction on them then judgment on the enemies so you got the that 50 days end of 50 day you know feast of trumpets time and then you've got the end of the sixth year of seals with the lord coming in and in that seventh year time and then you've got the end well if it's the end then what woe would this be it would have to be the final woe because this is when he's coming to bring that final judgment when he returns feet down on the mount of olives which is <clears throat> exactly as you read here in matthew chapter 24 when you see him coming as lightning from one end unto the other he's coming from lightning from one end unto the other um you see there's your great tribulation now taking place mid trumpets time frame told you you see so they're being cast into great tribulation so there that means they will survive and and those that survive having the mark and that sided with her in her fornications will be there for the mid trumpets when the pit is open and everything else um so here's the coming of the lord uh trauma gathered together one to heaven to the other what was my train of thought there let me go back um in relation to the woe when he's coming he's coming feet down on the mount of olives oh yeah so it's just we saw that point when he's coming oh that's what it is if we go to matthew chapter 28 matthew chapter 28 as we've showed the end of luke is the 40 days of the son of man the end of that's his coming for the 40 days the end of mark is the end of the six year seals the end of matthew is the end of six years of trumpets it's it represents that final 14th year and you see the same conversation going on when he says uh i think it maybe it was in chapter seven when he talks about being seen as uh lightning from one end unto the other but my point i wanted to show here was this right here in verse 18 
So this is a, a typology of him coming at the seventh year of trumpets, the 14th year of tribulation. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. They're now going to teach all nations the ways of the Lord, right? No more preaching. And he says, teaching them to observe also all things whatsoever I command you. I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Because he's now going to be here with them until the end of the millennial reign. If you go to Revelation chapter 11, you find out this same type of wording when everything is now his at the seventh trumpet. Okay? In Revelation 10, it says when the seventh trumpet begins to sound. This is why even in um, Matthew 24, it says immediately after the tribulation of those days. It's like Revelation 10, as soon as the trumpet begins to sound, the mystery of God is finished because it will be seen as lightning coming from one end to the other. And this is what it says about it. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. See, all connected to that final year beginning. And what is it? What is the seventh trumpet? It's the final third woe. So it says, woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Okay, this is speaking about Jerusalem. Remember, the judgment comes to Jerusalem and then the nations. Um, we come to verse 4, Zephaniah 3, 4. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. The priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. Remember, we know there's a priestly line of the connected with the 144 for which Christ had to do something again, right? So, uh, da -da -da, unjust, verse 6. I have cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste that none passeth by. The cities are destroyed so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. Well, right off the bat, there's, there's this pollution of things, this filthiness in Jerusalem. <coughs> we know judgment is coming on Jerusalem first and then coming on the nations okay in fact let's read a little bit further because what's coming next i said surely thou will fear me thou will receive instruction so their dwelling should not be cut off uh howsoever i will punish them but they rose early and corrupted all their doings therefore wait ye upon me saith the lord until the day that i rise up to the prey for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation and all my fierce anger. Hello. Does that sound familiar? Certainly does, doesn't it? Zechariah chapter 14, right? These things that we know so well. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken. And the houses rifled and the women ravished. And half the city shall go forth <coughs> excuse me, into captivity. And the residue of the people shall be cut off from the city. W what's coming first? There's a woe at that seventh trumpet, the start of the 14th year. The start of the 14th year, you mean the 14th chapter of the coming of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives? Exactly. Then it says, after he has allowed this to happen on Jerusalem, with the judgment against them first, in that final beginning of that final year, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. this I love this piece of scripture. I remember when it was first understood, when the revelation of it was first revealed, it was so awesome. 
because we understood the two stores, the two sorts, right? The end of the six year seals and the end of six years of trumpets. It's it's the sword of the Lord. Uh, you know, how else do you read this? Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. When did he fight in the day of battle? It was the Ezekiel 39 war. That stuff all connected with Jezebel, everything else. Ten horns at the end of the six years of seals. So now what is he going to do? Now he's going to go fight against these nations as he did those at that time. So we're seeing exactly the story of it coming against Jerusalem first and then him gathering the nations. And when he gathers those nations, what did it say? To pour out, to pour upon them his indignation? What is that pouring upon them is in, is indignation? Well, to me, it sounds like the bulls too, right? The bull judgments. But the bull judgments would come against Babylon, and then all the nations are what? Gathered with the sharp sword out of his mouth. He'll smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron and treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of Almighty God. Against who? All of those nations. And what do we know happens? Of course, the beast and the false prophet are taken alive and cast into the lake of fire. They're the first two cast alive into the lake of fire. Now, let's keep going as we bring this to an end. Listen to what comes next. Verse 9. See, after that judgment on all the nations, the 14th year of tribulation, it says, For then will I turn to the people, as for then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Verse 11, In that day thou shalt not be ashamed for all thy doings wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride. <coughs> and thou shall no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. It seems to say that that's part of the pride that they had, right? The Lord was there and they were being haughty in it. Um, I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity nor speak lies, neither shall a, defeat, a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. <clears throat> Israel's joy and restoration, you see? Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day, it gets pretty cool. In that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not thou, and to Zion, let not thine hand be slack. Remember what's going to happen. When they go back, they're going to have to rebuild, right? They're going to have to repair. So let your hands not be slack, right? It's not this building that you might think, uh, uh, um, which is, comes um, uh, at the end of seals to begin trumpets. This is the rebuilding uh, in the repairing of the temple. And is it Amos chapter 9, I think? <clears throat> We see this, right? When they're going to rebuild, they're going to restore this tabernacle. They're going to close up the breaches thereof. You see, again, all with the treader of the grapes. Perfect timing. And we see this also in, is it Isaiah 65, I believe? Isaiah 65. New heavens be earth. Behold, I created new heavens and new earth. Former old have passed away. Um, see, even because what this is here, okay, so this one here <coughs> in Isaiah 65, 17, isn't about the temple. This is when he restores the earth. This is not new Jerusalem coming down. Okay. When he says, I create new heavens, 
this new thing that he's doing, look at what it means. He's to, to be new, which is to rebuild and to repair. Because he's going to repair the earth, right? The water is going to flow out. He's going to repair the earth. It's going to be the, the final jubilee. The earth will be renewed and the temple will be repaired. That's what's taking place. So again, Zephaniah chapter 3. Um, not see evil anymore. Okay. Then it says, this is great. Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. Now listen to this. He will joy over thee with singing. What? What? It, it, it brings a chill over your body. My, my eyes are even welling up a little bit. Ponder that verse. Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord God will rejoice over them all. And he will so rest in his love in them that in his joy, the Lord God is going to sing. What? What? I mean, it almost seems like, oh, of course. I mean, of course the Lord would sing. It never dawned on me before that the Lord God would sing. We would be the ones all singing to him. But the Lord God singing over them? Awesome. Awesome stuff. I can't even imagine. <laughs> I, I, I can't even comprehend it. But there it is. And finally, listen to this. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Brothers and sisters, what assembly do you think this is? If you recall, Deuteronomy 16 is the revelation of the end of days and the pre, mid, and post. It starts with the pre-trib Feast of Weeks. Then, it's the seven days as seven years of unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. The seven years of seals are six years and then the Lord is here in the seventh, and there is no more affliction. He destroyed the enemies at that time, as we covered. He, he gathers in and, and anoints the 144. The great multitude comes in. He makes a covenant with the nations. It's six days or six years. And on the seventh is the solemn assembly in the seventh day, which is the great multitude rapture. That's not the solemn assembly we're looking for. Then, because who are we talking about here? This entire storyline was Judah. And it's the seven years of trumpet judgments, which are Judah's. So let's have a look at this. Deuteronomy 16, verse 13, is the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles has seven days, which are the picture of the seven years of trumpet judgments. During the seven years of trumpet judgments, guess what? It's six years, but when the Lord returns in the seventh year of trumpets, it's still tribulation time. It's that final year as Noah, remember? So it's not like the six of, of unleavened bread and then the seventh is the assembly to the Lord because the seventh year as the seventh day of tabernacles is still this judgment of the Lord. It's when this... When this final judgment comes on Jerusalem, as we saw, it's Zechariah 14. Then he gathers all the nations. He destroys them. And it's, it's what's called in Matthew 24, the days of Noah. It's the final 14th year. So there is no sixth and then the seventh. And guess what? 
in the Feast of Tabernacles, there is no six days and then the seventh. It's seven days of this solemn feast. But what happens after the seventh day of Tabernacles? Well, just as it will be seven years of tribulation, because even though the Lord has returned, he's going to be bringing judgment on all the enemies that will take place during the entirety of that seventh year. So it's those seven days as seven years. When is this, 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 uh, um, this uh, uh, solemn assembly? When does this solemn assembly then come for Judah? Well, if Judah is trumpets and tabernacles is the representation of trumpets, then what do you think comes after the seven days of tabernacles? Leviticus 23, 36. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire on, unto the Lord. On the eighth day, for those that don't understand what this is, here is the end of day's chart. Seven easy years, and it all begins with the Feast of Trumpets. You have seven years of seals. They are a picture of the seven days of unleavened bread, six of which are the, the days of unleavened bread, and the seventh is the solemn assembly for the great multitude rapture. Then you have the seven years of trumpet judgments, which is to Judah, of which the seven, just like the seven days, are solemn, uh, uh, solemn, what was it, feast, okay? Full seven days, not six and then seven, but a full seven. Because that seventh year of trumpets, it is all about the destruction of the enemies by the Lord. And what is then the eighth day? You see? Seven, and then the eighth. The final 15th that we would call, in the big picture, it's the 22nd year, seven, seven, seven. What are they? Seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years. 49 years. This, these equal the same thing as saying the 49 years in a jubilee cycle count. Only the 49th year can be as it was in the days of Noah, because the days of Noah were one year and ten days. And in the 49th year of a jubilee cycle, only happens in the 49th year on the tenth day later, which is called atonement, which means it ends 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets. Just like it began at the Feast of Trumpets. Ten days later, they sound the shofar on the Day of Atonement for Jubilee, which is called the Great Eighth Day. And what do we call it? Seven days, and only Tabernacles has one more day attached to it, called the Eighth Day. And on the Eighth Day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. Bam. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? Brothers and sisters, we just we can now add another check to another book having been revealed in the prophets. It's awesome. The spirit is leading, guys. We are being prepared. There is a remnant group, as we saw, who are being prepared to serve the Lord. You don't reveal the game plan and then tell them to go home and call up the farm team for the biggest game ever. You send in those you've been preparing and working with. So awesome. So awesome. Brothers and sisters, I pray it blesses you. I, I pray you, you take the time, you study these things out. Seek them, search them out, pray over them. Ask the Spirit to guide you, lead you to open up your eyes to the revelation and understanding of it. Because it is powerful. And in the next video, 
we the next teaching we are going to have some fun it's going to be exciting it's going to be wow i had no idea this is taking place for some of you and then we're going to see whose plan whose plan is going to play out the lord's plan that revealed this is truly the 70th year or is it going to be the world's plan of man and their robots I put all in on the Lord God's plan. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. Thank you always. Bye for now.